Welcome to the second part of the lecture on generative modeling. In this part, I will be discussing variational autoencoders, or as I like to call them, gossip machines. So a variational autoencoder is actually very similar to a normal autoencoder, where we map an input through some bottleneck and try to reconstruct that input on the other end. The way I like to think about this bottleneck is as though we are trying to whisper the most important information about the input through it. And as opposed to a normal autoencoder, in a variational autoencoder, we are going to enforce this bottleneck to follow some probability distribution. And if we do that good enough, we can then drop the encoder and sample from this probability distribution in the latent space and dream up or generate completely new outputs, right? So we don't even need this encoder anymore in the end. Now, how do we train this autoencoder, this variational autoencoder, very important? Well, we can of course do maximum likelihood estimation. We are going to max find the maximum likelihood of our data. Now, first of all, we are going to marginalize over this Z. So we are going to say, okay, arc max of actually this joint distribution of X and Z together, and then we sum over Z. And then we can create the conditional given and multiplied by the prior. And this gives us a nice and easy understanding of it, right? Because this left one part is actually the decoder, right? X given the latent code Z. And this right part is what we choose Z to follow. And for example, we can choose a Gaussian as it's often done. Of course, we need to look at our entire data set and not just the data points. And we will make use of the log likelihood trick to change multiplication into addition. So we sum over entire data set as follows, and then we have the log likelihood. However, now we run into a problem because we have introduced this marginalization over Z but this summation is now inside of our logarithm, which brings big problems. And this is typically intractable. Now, how do we solve this? We are not going to uh, directly optimize this function. Instead, we are going to optimize a tractable lower bound of this function. Now, how are we going to do this? We are going to introduce a couple of tricks, unfortunately. And trick one is we are going to introduce the estimated posterior. So we're going to actually introduce the reverse. So we already had X given Z, and now we're going to introduce Z given X here in blue. And if we multiply right by that thing divided by itself, that's the same as multiplying by one, and which is so completely allowed. And we can already see what this blue part is going to be, right? It's going to be the encoder. Now, the second trick which we're going to introduce is Jensen's inequality. And Jensen's inequality is going actually to allow us to move this summation and one of these blue terms, one of the encoder terms, outside of the logarithm. So let's have a slight detour. What is Jensen's inequality? Jensen's inequality is actually fairly simple. Jensen's inequality states that if we have a concave function, so here in black we've got a concave function, if we evaluate this function at two points, let's say x1 and x2, if we draw a line between x1 and x2 directly, every point on this line is going to be below that function, which is, of course, the definition of a concave function. Now, a logarithm is a concave function. So, for example, 0.7 times a logarithm plus 0.3 times a logarithm is always going to be smaller than this summation inside this logarithm. Now, and more in generally, this does not even hold for, let's say, two points on the logarithm, but any weighted sum of points on this logarithm. And this Jensen's inequality is now going to allow us actually to move this outside of the logarithm. So the logarithm is concave, and we've got a weighted sum, actually, right? We've got the sum, and we can treat this Q as the weight. And then we can move this sum and the weight outside of the logarithm. 
And here is the inequality, right? Here is our bound, right? We can see this inequality happening. Now, this is often called the evidence lower bound or elbow loss. And what we can immediately observe is if our encoder is actually perfect, then the bound is tight and we are exactly optimizing likelihood. Now, the last trick we are going to introduce is we are going to rewrite into two terms, one of which is going to be the KL divergence. So we can observe we have got a summation of logarithms, right? And in this logarithm, there's a multiplication. Now this multiplication, we can actually split, right? So we will split the first term here on the left. We get encoder times the logarithm of the decoder minus, and over here, we've switched these two terms around to get a minus over here. And then we have blue times the logarithm of the blue part divided by P of Z itself. And this second term is actually exactly equal to the KL divergence, which I will delve into in the next slide. So we have rewritten two KL divergence, and now we get two terms. On the left, we get an expectation, and we can see the following. We can see we get the expectation over the encoder here, and then the logarithm of the decoder, which is actually regular maximum likelihood estimation. If you were to write this out for a Gaussian error, you just get the mean squared error. Here on the right, however, we've now got an extra regularization term on our autoencoder. This KL divergence measures the difference between two probability distributions. So it's actually measuring the difference between the probability distribution as given by our encoder towards the freely chosen prior distribution of Z. So for example, we choose Z to be normal, then we also have to enforce that, right? So we are enforcing that our encoder is actually going to create normally distributed latent codes. So overall, this looks as follows. We've got input images on the left here and output images on the right. We are mapping through a variational bottleneck given an encoder, which is the following probability, conditional probability distribution, and a decoder. And we've got two terms. The left one says the output should look like the input. And the second term says, okay, these latent codes, these should actually follow our predefined distribution. So for example, a Gaussian. Now, we have the following question then. If the encoder and decoder are deterministic neural networks, how do we introduce randomness? Now, the answer is actually that the decoder is going to output parameters of a distribution. So it's not going to give random outputs, it's going to give you deterministic outputs, which then form a probability distribution. So for example, it outputs a vector of means and a vector of variances. And then we will sample from that normal distribution to put this in the decoder. And now we can actually write out what this KL divergence is. Because if our encoder outputs a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma, but we want that to follow a zero and one normal distribution, the KL divergence actually has an analytical form uh, and it's as follows. It's the summation over mean squared minus two log of the standard deviation plus the variance minus one. And we do a summation over J, which is the summation of the dimensionality of the bottleneck. And what we can immediately observe is that this mean appears once, right? We've got the squared of the mean. So if we try to minimize this, we're going to push the mean towards zero. And this second part might look complex, but if we draw it out, it actually looks like this. So over here, we've got sigma, and over here, we've got the KL term, and we can see that we will minimize sigma if we make it exactly equal to one. So this KL divergence is now going to make sure that this mean and sigma is going to be following 
zero, one normal distribution. But of course, it doesn't have to exactly follow this distribution because we have a second loss term, which is going to be opposing this force. And this second loss term is of course the mean squared error if we choose a Gaussian error. Now, then the last question that remains to be answered is, if we sample in the bottleneck, how do we back propagate to the encoder, right? Sampling is not uh, a, an operation which you can calculate a derivative on. Now the answer is we're going to reparameterize this. In this case, we will have that the latent goes Z is actually equal to mu plus sigma times epsilon. And epsilon is a true random noise where we sample epsilon from zero and one. And now Z, this latent code Z, will actually follow this normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma. I would say check this for yourself, write it out. It's actually a very good exercise. And now back propagation is actually possible, right? We can sample from epsilon during the forward pass and view it as a constant during the back propagation, right? We can now easily write out the derivatives everywhere. And we are effectively getting a Monte Carlo expectation, right? We are effectively saying, okay, this expectation here, this Z given Q, we are giving one sample at each training batch. Now, in practice, how do we go about one training example? Well, we do it as follows. First, we encode. We have X and we push it through the encoder with parameters phi and we get out mu and sigma. Then we draw a sample of epsilon and we will calculate what Z is. And then we push this Z through the decoder to get X hat. And then the loss function is actually rather simple. If we assume a Gaussian error, we will get a mean squared error here between x hat and x. And the KL divergence, if we have chosen z to follow a normal distribution of 0 and 1, looks as follows. So the total loss function is as follows. And we can now easily backpropagate and update both the parameters of the decoder and the encoder. Now, if we have trained this completely, as I said in the start, we can now generate new data easily. We can just ignore the encoder and only use the decoder. And we will directly use basically the noise epsilon and push it through the decoder to get new pictures. And then we can also do some very fancy stuff. So, for example, we can observe, okay, maybe if we have a two-dimensional latent code, what picture is situated everywhere. So over here we've trained this on MNIST and we can see that over here we've got ones, over here we've got sixes and zeros and nines and sevens, right? It's nicely distributed in this latent space. And you will actually be seeing the same in the exercises. We can also interpolate in the latent space. So for example, if we've trained this on images, we can easily move between the latent codes of different images to you know, interpolate and get this nice mixing effect between images. We can even try to find, okay, on which axis are certain parameters in the latent space, like smiling or glasses. So that were VAEs, and in the next part, we will be dealing with generative adversarial networks.